At the conclusion of our study last week, we were looking at Paul and his time in Troas. Uh, if you remember, Paul arrived in Troas, and his original plan was to go over into Corinth first and uh, visit with the brethren there, go up into Macedonia, then come back through Corinth and visit a second time. But when he arrived in Troas, he did not receive word from Titus. And uh, what it seems is that Titus was, he was expecting Titus to bring word of how the Corinthians had received his first letter. And he was very anxious to hear from Titus. And so when he arrived there in Troas, he did not find Titus, and he did not know exactly the situation there in Corinth. And so at that point, he, had, he decided just to go on up into Macedonia and work his way back down into Corinth after that. Uh, we discussed a little bit about the door that was open to him there in Troas. We're not told a lot about that, whether or not he was able to take full advantage of that or not, or if it was a door that was going to remain open for some time, maybe for him or others to take advantage of, but we do know that there was an opportunity there in, in Troas, uh, but he felt the need to continue on to try to go and search for Titus to figure out exactly the state of things there in Corinth. He wanted his visit in Corinth when he arrived, he wanted it to be one of joy, and he did not want to go into Corinth there having to begin by correcting them or to uh, uh, have to do things that, that would not be uh, comfortable or, or just uh, that, that he didn't want to do and the Corinthians did, didn't really, he, he didn't want things to be uncomfortable when he arrived and he wanted to be a time of joy for him when he arrived in Corinth. So not finding Titus there in Troas, he then continues on into Macedonia and he ends up encountering Titus, and that's where we'll pick up this morning. Uh, in the last part of chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, where he begins to offer thanks to God. Uh, we'll go ahead and read verses 14 through 17. He says there, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the ones who are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life, and who is sufficient for the things. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. And so just as Paul had declared his anxiety, in previous verses, in the previous chapters of, of uh, 2 Corinthians, he now declares his gratefulness. Uh, he doesn't really finish the story of how he met Titus. We really don't know all the circumstances surrounding that. He, what he does is kind of let this outburst of feeling, this outburst of uh, thanksgiving kind of give us a little bit of a picture of the joyous uh, scene that may be unfolded when he and Titus finally met up. When Titus was able to finally give him the good news that the Corinthians had, had read his first letter, that they had accepted that, that they had began to make correction and to deal with the things that were wrong, that, that they were doing that was wrong there. And so we see that this was a huge relief to Paul. And uh, as we said last week and in the previous weeks, you know, the anxiety that he was feeling over the Corinthian brethren was great. And, and so we can, we can therefore surmise that the relief that he felt when he and Titus actually were able to meet and Titus was able to share with him the situation there in Corinth was probably just as great, if not, if not more so. And so... You know, just as he had declared his anxiety, he now declares his gratefulness, how thankful he was, and of course he's giving God all the credit there. You know, God had not failed to deliver him from danger. Uh, we see all throughout the ministry of Paul how that God was always there to deliver him, to help him, to give him what he needed, 
and therefore, again, he, he understood that, and, and through God's will, Paul had once again triumphed over his enemies, those who were trying to uh, say things about him that were not true, and, and uh, you know, especially there in Corinth, and, and, if, and we see other places where, the, where you know, he, they say God saved him from physical danger as well. So Corinth is no exception. God had blessed him and had, and had kept him uh, from, uh, from danger and, and had blessed in his ministry and what he was doing there. Chapter 2 then is concluded with Paul reaffirming his sincerity and the purity of the gospel that he was preaching. And we see him doing this throughout his letters and throughout his, his uh, letters, especially with, with the church there at Corinth, how that you know, he was reiterating the fact that he was preaching the gospel, that this was not his own message, that this was a message that was given to him from God, and so this is God in reality speaking to them directly through him. Uh, there in verse 17, he says, For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we might speak in the sight of God in Christ. And so, again, Paul is stating that, that what I am speaking is God's words. And God is speaking to you through me. You know, some would alter what they are preaching to accommodate the crowd that they are speaking to. And this has not changed throughout the centuries. This was the case in the first century. It's the case today. There are many, many preachers standing up today preaching to, to congregations of people, and they are preaching the things that the, the people want to hear. Not necessarily the things that the people need to hear, but what they want to hear so that they feel good about themselves, so that they continue to come back, so they continue to give the money, so that the, job, the preacher will continue to have a job. And in many cases, these preachers are making hefty sums of money because they are preaching things that the people want to hear. They are peddling the Word of God. In a sense, they're selling, they're selling what, they want, what the people want to hear. They're peddling. They're selling things. In contrast, Paul and his companions, they preach with sincerity. They preach what God wants the people to hear, and many times that's not what the people want to hear but it's what God wants them to hear. They do not alter the message to fit the audience. And there again, they do that because they speak in the presence of Christ. And so he took his, he took his duty, he took the job that, that God has given him very seriously. And he, he wanted to make sure that they understood the sincerity with which he was doing these things uh, and make them to, again, reiterate and to understand that this was what God was wanting them to hear. So with that, we conclude chapter 2. Are there any comments, any questions, anything anybody would like to say before we move on into chapter 3? Again, chapter 3 is closely connected. You know, if we understand, you know, Paul didn't put the chapter divisions in there. That was something that, that men did to, to make it easier for us to navigate through the Bible. But, you know, originally we would just be flowing right in to the next, to the next words here. But chapter 3 opens by Paul uh, discussing how that the Corinthians were his living epistle. We understand that an epistle is, is just a letter, it's something sent forth. And so Paul was, was telling or tells the Corinthians that they are his living epistle. And so we'll go ahead and begin by reading the first three verses there. It says, Do we begin again to commend our, ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, 
ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And so we see that he begins by asking a question, do we begin again to commend ourselves? And so Paul is saying, are we commending ourselves? Are we recommending ourselves? Are we boasting about ourselves? And what we understand as we read Paul's epistles, all of his letters, not only to Corinth, but other churches as well, we see that he was not in the habit of self, self-recommendation, self-commendation. And he actually condemns the practice. If you look at back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, it says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. And so Paul here is stating, you know, we dare not do the things that others are doing. Recommending themselves, commending themselves, measuring themselves, trying to create maybe some sort of hierarchy or rating system or, you know, I'm greater than he is. You know, I'm comparing myself to him. I mean, we could probably spend two or three lessons just discussing you know, the few words that he he says here in chapter 10. But Paul says we dare not do that. And so this is something that that he doesn't do and that he he warns others against. You look ahead in 2 Corinthians in chapter 10 and verse 18, it says, "For, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. And so here again, he, uh, he reiterates this fact that self-commendation is not something that we need to be doing or practicing. <clears throat> he also states that he did not need letters of commendation to the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul could be implying that the false apostles who were still working there in Corinth, if you remember, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, e- even though you know, it seems like most most of the congregation there was making correction that they were, they were trying to apply that first letter. We understand that there were still some false apostles there that they were trying to work against Paul. And so he might be implying that some of these false apostles uh, had used letters of recommendation. If we look at the last part of verse 1, it says, Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Are records of commendation from you. And so it might seem that some of these others had come in there bringing letters or desiring letters from the church of Corinth. And so, uh, you know, maybe they were using these letters false, falsely. Maybe these letters were uh, forged or, or something like that. We really don't know. But, uh, but it seems like there was something going on, on there. Uh, When we look at this idea of these letters of recommendation, we see that letters of recommendation had a purpose, and they could be used for good. And we see people using them throughout the New Testament. You look at Apollos, and as he began to travel into into Achaia, you know, he used letters of recommendation. Acts chapter 18, verses 27 and 28. And here again, we're speaking of Apollos, it says, And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so we see that the brethren wrote these letters for Apollos as he traveled into this region, and it seemed that they were a help to him because that when he arrived, you know, he, he was able to begin vigorously refuting and showing people from the scriptures. And so these letters of recommendation helped him uh, to be received by the Christians there and uh, maybe in some ways hit the ground running, so to speak. Instead of having to go through a lot of formalities, a lot of, you know, proving who he was, proving his credentials or whatever, this letter it seems, helped him to hit the ground running and be able to carry on with the work there. We see Paul himself wrote letters of recommendations for others. 
we see how that he recommended Phoebe. In Romans chapter 16, the first two verses, he says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. And so we see here, Paul is writing on behalf of Phoebe. And, and telling the church there at Rome to help her, to assist her. You know, the things that she is doing, are, you know, they are good. And you need to assist her and aid her in those things. We also see that Barnabas spoke for Paul. If you remember back, you know, when Paul was Saul, how he persecuted the church and how he was going around, uh, you know, uh, putting Christians in jail, even even consenting to their deaths and things like that, uh, you know, he was converted. And so now he begins to, to minister for Christ and, and, to, and to teach and, and, to, uh, and to really, he, he did, a, he did a, an about face, going the other direction. And of course, the Christians had heard about him and they were very cautious about having anything to do with him. And so it wasn't a letter, but we see Barnabas speaking up for Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, it says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how that he had seen the Lord on the road and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so here we see upon the recommendation of Barnabas, that Paul then was able to, uh, to begin his ministry there in Jerusalem and therefore be, begin to aid the saints and to teach and to do the things that he needed to do there. And so we see that letters of recommendation or recommending saints were an important part of the early church. They could help to attest to the character of the Christian who was traveling to a place that might be previously unknown to them. They could attest to their soundness, their faith, and their personal character. And so we see that this was a, seems to be an integral part of the early church and the spreading of the gospel. And I believe this is something that we could even use today as we are moving maybe from region to region you know, we, we need to, uh, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to take a letter of recommendation. I think it, it, it's in order for a congregation, you know, say if I was to go into a new congregation in another state, for that congregation, their leadership or the men, or depending on how, it's, how things are going there, you know, somebody call back and say, hey, what about this guy? Is, you know, is he faithful? Do we need to, do we need to watch out for him? What, are there any issues that, that, that we need to help him with? And so I think all of these things are good, they're fitting, and they can be, uh, they can be of use even today as, as we work and as we try to uh, help others and to join other congregations. Anybody have any comments or anything they'd like to um, say or add or anything along those lines? But when we look at Paul and Corinth, we see that it was absurd to think that he needed such a letter written on his behalf to the church there at Corinth. You know, why would Paul, why would this be absurd? Well, you know, he had helped to build that congregation from the foundation up. He was there at the very beginning. He, he, he was there when the congregation was built. Uh, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. Let each one, <clears throat> but let each one take heed how he builds on it. And so we see that Paul was there when the foundation of the church at Corinth was laid. And I believe this is a figurative thing. I don't think we're talking about a physical church building at Corinth. I think he's talking about the, 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 the church 
you know, in, in the sense of the people. When, when, when the church was coming together and when it was being organized, you know, Paul was there when the foundation was laid. He was what he termed their father in the gospel. If we go over to chapter 4 and verse 15 of 1 Corinthians, it says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And so we see that he was their father in the gospel. And so normally we don't need a letter of recommendation for our father, do we? We, we know, we probably know more than most people about our fathers. And so it was absurd to think that Paul would need such a letter of recommendation. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if the reason that, that he is kind of dealing with this is that maybe those false apostles were saying, you know, look, we have these letters. We, we have no letter from Paul. You know, maybe they were trying to use their letters of recommendation as a way to prove that they, uh, that, that they had, um, you know, that, that they should be listened to rather than Paul. Uh, this could have been, been the case. But what we need to understand, even today, is that ultimately a person's actions are the recommendation, are, are their true recommendation, what they are teaching. You look at what John said in 2 John verses 10 and 11. It says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And so it doesn't matter what sort of letter of recommendation someone brings. If they're not bringing the gospel in, then we don't need to receive them. You know, Paul and John and the other apostles, they were teaching words as we've seen directly that, that were given to them directly from God. But if someone comes in and they may have a letter of recommendation, but they begin to teach things opposite to what these apostles were teaching them, we know we shouldn't accept them. We should be wary of people. And so rec letters of recommendations are good, they're great, but ultimately we need to be looking at what preachers are teaching, what the words that they are saying, the actions that they are performing. Uh, we, that's the main thing that we look at there. Any comments or anything? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, he was unafraid. He wasn't cowardly. Yeah, he put his neck on the line there. Yeah. I mean, uh, we can learn a lot from Barnabas. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Anything else? Anything else? Uh, he said that Paul also had stated in 1 Corinthians that he planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. So Paul was there in the very beginning, planting there in Corinth. That's point. You may, maybe, I may not have heard it, but <clears throat> in verse 2, the beginning, he says, you are our epistle. <laughs> written in our hearts and in verse 3 it says clearly you are an epistle of Christ each individual Christian 
is an epistle. We're we're a letter that is that that we are writing that is being read. And I don't know if this is a stretch, uh, but I think each individual Christian is is writing their own epistle, their own letter that is being read. And uh, Paul is making application here to to justify or to emphasize the fact that he doesn't need any other verification because they are the verification, you know, that he is who he says he is. They yeah. are his epistle. But I think there's an added thought there, just the idea of the individual Christian is an epistle. And, you know, and we are writing uh, our letter as, our, as a Christian. And we need to be very uh, conscious of that fact. Yep. And that's a good introduction to my next point because that was where I was going. <laughs> there, the Corinthians were Paul's epistle. And so we, let's double back and let's go ahead and reread verses 2 and 3. It says, You are our epistle written on, in our hearts, known and read by all men. To, to Gerald's point there. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. So they're an epistle of Paul. They're Paul's epistles, but clearly they are an epistle of Christ. Because why? Paul was teaching the gospel of Christ. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, which seems to be a reference back to the old law, how that the old law was written on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And so this letter, the letter, the epistle, Paul speaks of here, it's, it's not a literal letter. It's not one that's written with literal pen and ink. It wasn't a letter written or chiseled out in stone. It's a living letter. It was lived, it was written by the Spirit of the living God. And so the letter that the Corinthians, the epistles that was the Corinthians was one that everyone could read as they lived, as they, as they moved around in the community, as they dealt with, with their family, with business acquaintances, with, with other people. You know, this was the letter that was being read by everyone. This letter, you know, they were changed, they were shaped by the Holy Spirit to represent Christ. And so they were an epistle of Christ. And the Holy Spirit did this by changing their hearts. If you look at uh, Hebrews 8 and verse 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make within the with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so we see here the Hebrew writer was discussing kind of this same sort of, of idea, the scenario, how that, that the word is going to go in, into the hearts, it's going to change them. Others are going to be able to see that and be able to read that epistle. Again, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16 this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And so we see that the fruit that we bear, the fruit that the Corinthians bore, the fruit that, you know, all these Christians in the early church and every Christian since then, the, the fruit that we bear is the epistle the epistle that everyone can read. We look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we are walking in the Spirit, we are living, we are a living epistle. And if we are a living epistle, then what are people reading from us? What are they reading in our life? They're reading love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the epistle that we as Christians should be living and, and, should, and others should be reading 
from us. We are living epistles. The Corinthians themselves were an epistle of Christ, as we, as we stated, which commended his ministry to others. You look at what Christ said on the Sermon of the, on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. He says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And in seeing the good works that we are doing, what are they going to do? Glorify the Father in heaven. So as people read the epistle of our lives, and as, and as we are living out the gospel, as we are living the things that we are called to do as Christians, as we are producing those fruit that we read about, then as people read that, ultimately, they're going to glorify our Father in heaven because they are reading the epistle that he has written on our hearts. It rings true for us today. As I was studying this last night, the song, The World's Bible, came to mind. And that middle, that middle uh Verse there says, we are the only Bible the careless world will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message, given in deed and word. We are the world's Bible. We are the, we are the only epistle that the vast majority of the world will ever read. So we need to make sure they're reading the correct thing. We need to make sure that what we are living is what God wants them to see. Because if we're, if we're not doing, if we're not bearing the proper fruit, then God's not going to be glorified. And we talked last week in depth at, at how Satan uses good and turns it into evil and we see so much of that today we see so much of it in the denominational world how that you know they 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 try to do good but they're doing it in a way that's evil that's against god's proper order of things and the things that he has authorized for us to do we we see all this good being done but Satan has turned it into evil because it's, it's pulling people away from God. So we need to make sure that the people are reading the proper things in our life. Yes. Yeah. We're going to be found out. Yeah. Now, now, whether we like it or not, we have a reputation. People know about us. They know our works. You know, if, even if we don't do anything, then, then we've got a reputation for someone that doesn't do anything. <laughs> so no matter what, we have that, recommend, that, that reputation. And it can either recommend to us or it cannot. You look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, it says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without faults in a midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So without a doubt, we are living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, a generation that calls evil good and good evil, a generation that... that that wants to take God out of, out of every aspect of our lives. A generation that, that, that will kill innocent children. Uh, 
and, and it's a generation that, that's evil, but it's always been evil. It was evil in the first century. But just like Paul and the other first century Christians, we can shine as lights in the world. We can be this epistle of God that others are reading in our conduct. And if they can't see Christ in our conduct, why would they ever listen to us teaching them about Christ? If we are ever to have the hope of converting our friends, our acquaintances, our family, they must see Christ in our conduct. Because why would they listen to us teaching to them about Christ if we're not living it? If they can't read that epistle in our life. Any other comments or anything along those lines? As we continue on there in verse 4, we see where Paul begins to speak about how, how God makes us adequate, how God makes us sufficient. If we look at verses 4 through 6, it says, And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of, of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You remember the question that we read just at the beginning of class there, the last part of verse 16 of chapter 2. It says, and who is sufficient for these things? You know, Paul asked the question, who is sufficient for these things? Well, he, he, he begins to answer his question. And, of course, he could be sufficient. But where did he get that sufficiency? It didn't originate within him. You know, what set him apart from all of these false apostles? Well, the answer lies in where does Paul get his sufficiency? You look at where Paul gets his sufficiency, and then you look at where these false apostles get their sufficiency, and you begin to see a difference. Paul relied upon God. False teachers, all these people accusing Paul of all these things, they received their sufficiency within themselves or, or somewhere else other than God. What Paul says is that his own accomplishments, accomplishments were not due to his own ability. You know, many times today, you know, someone has this ability to to, to teach or to preach, or, or even if it's a sec, you know, some, we're talking secularly, you know, they have the ability to build, build things or, or, to, or to write computer programs or things like that. You know, they, they want to think, that, well, you know, that ability is mine, you know, you know I, it originates with me, you know, things like that. But what we need to understand is nothing originates with us. God has given us these abilities, and any ability that we may have to do anything, the ability that we had to even walk in here this morning was given to us by God. And we have that ability by His good pleasure. And that can be snatched away from us. How many athletes, how many, how many people of great renown have we seen, you know, their, those abilities snatched away with, with, with an accident, with illness, with, with anything like that? You know, God can take it away from us. And he can humble us in an instant. And if we, if we are putting our trust in that ability, if, if that is what we, you know, we pride ourselves in, if that is what we sustain ourselves with, then a situation like that will break us. But if we are like Paul... And, and we realize, well, God can give it. He can take it away. He can take this away. But maybe tomorrow he's going to give me this over here. And we wait on God. And we understand that God's in control. And God wants what's best for us. 
then it doesn't matter what's given or taken away, we are still going to be that epistle of Christ. You know, our accomplishments, our abilities are not our own. You know, Paul said even the words he spoke were not his own. You know, 2 Peter, uh, well, he didn't say that. Well, he may have said it, but the passage I'm, I'm looking at is 2 Peter chapter 1. And verse 21 says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So Peter, John, Paul, the other apostles, they understood that even the words that they were saying were not their own. They were moved to say those words by the Holy Spirit. In and of themselves, they were insufficient. God was the reason that they are what they are. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. It says, But the grace of God, but by the grace of God I am who I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, not yet I, but the grace of God which was in me. I don't think you know, this idea that Paul says, I labored more abundantly than they all, I don't think that's necessarily a boast. I, I, I think he's, he's giving God all the credit there. I think that was a statement of fact. I did more because, God, I, I, because I relied upon God. And my sufficiency was through Him. And therefore, I am what I am. Because God made me and he gave it to me. Any other comments or anything right quick before we close up? Lord willing, next week we'll uh, say just a little bit more about, about this as far as our sufficiency. And then we'll move on into the chapter as Paul begins to compare the old covenant with the new covenant. And Lord willing, we'll pick up there next, next week. I appreciate, appreciate everyone's attention and those who participated. Thank you.